A warm welcome to INHAP's 75th webinar. Before I hand over to today's uh, speakers, I'll take a few minutes to explain the background to INHAP's Rethinking City webinar series. The series was conceived two years ago in June 2020 in the midst of the pandemic and um, in a way to reflect on what was unfolding in our cities at the time. But it is also a natural extension of INHAP's earlier work and effort in spearheading an initiative known as Citizens Urban Initiative or Situary for short, based on challenges foreseen in India's growth story. We expect two thirds of the world's population to live in urban areas by 2050. And in India, this amounts to a projection of 877 million people. An important milestone when for the first time more people will live in urban areas than in rural areas. But the nature of urbanization is complex. And of course, there are statewide differences across the country. A lot of growth is taking place on the fringes in small and medium towns. And what we are beginning to realize perhaps is that it's not urbanization itself that is a problem, but uh, the ability to manage it, resulting in cities that we have today. And we hope that through the webinar series, we're able to convey the message loud and clear that as people, government and society, we are not in tune with the challenge. Framing a proper response is a huge task, keeping both the present and the future in mind. A failure to plan, manage and develop cities properly will entail a heavy cost for millions of people who make urban areas their home. And so we need a new mindset, new approaches and perhaps new agencies even. How do we, or in fact, can we really reap the benefits of cities as economic growth centers and places of aspiration without the exploitative instincts and inequities that are inherently a consequence? And that is one of the many questions the webinar series hopes to open up for discussion. The series, of course, will feed into the Citizens Urban Initiative, an effort by INHAP to bring together people to work on a blueprint that outlines the country's response to the urban challenge. And there are three objectives that are part of this. One is to, of course, reassess India's urban challenge. Two, to rethink the Indian city. And three, to reformulate the response in the context of national, not just local, and not just urban development challenges. In Half's view is that for any approach to be truly transformative, it must be located within a multidisciplinary effort. And in many ways, we hope that this webinar can build into that collective supporting constituency to take wider ownership as we move ahead. Till date, the webinar has engaged with over 100 knowledge partners, both national and international, and over 350 urban experts, or professional civil society organizations, and community voices to share their perspectives on multiple themes. Today's webinar adds one more dimension on the challenges of securing the urban commons. It is the second in a four-part series on ESG imaginaries to make cities work. For those who may have missed part one, you will find it on the INHAP social media handles as you will all the earlier webinars and the forthcoming ones. Um, I'd like to now hand over to the moderators for today, Leo Saldana and Bhargavi Rao from the Environment Support Group based out of Bangalore. Leo Saldana is full-time coordinator and trustee of ESG with wide ranging experience in environmental law and policy, human rights and development issues and a key campaigner on social justice issues to secure the interest of distressed communities. Bhargavi Rao is director at the Center for Financial Accountability and a senior fellow and trustee at ESG, working at the intersections of community action, law, policy, planning, and governance. She has also part of educational institutions. This is a discussion we are very much looking forward to. Um, I'd like to hand over now to the moderators. Thank you. Thank you, Kea. And uh, thanks, everybody. A very warm welcome to uh, the second uh, session of uh, the webinar. And we are very privileged and uh, very thankful to Kirtisha and everybody at INHA for giving us this opportunity to share our work. Uh, this is also a proud moment to share that ESG turns 25 this year, and it's not been an easy journey. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, work issues. Uh, you know, it's been like a river that uh, goes through different courses in its journey. Uh, it's been like that. And today's uh, theme of urban commons is something that ESD has engaged with since the very beginning, since its inception way back in 1998. It was, it was in fact the commons that brought a few of us together 
uh, and uh, made us uh, look into issues of the environment and social justice and that was what gave birth to the organization itself. So uh, in our journey of uh, working with the commons, we've worked on a variety of uh, commons, not just in urban areas, but also in rural areas. In the urban areas, we've looked at urban forests, lakes, grazing pastures within urban um, areas. We've looked at parks, we've looked at streets, we've looked at markets, and we've engaged with the local communities, we've engaged with uh, the administration and the various decision makers. And uh, we've also worked with uh, rural commons and in today's presentation, we'll share some of these uh, challenges that uh, we've addressed. And it's also an honor to share that uh, our work on the lakes also received the UN Water Award way back in 2012. And we also had the privilege of meeting with uh, Eleanor Ostrom at that point of time. Uh, just before she moved on and uh, she had written a letter to us and praising the kind of positions we took at that point of time when lakes were getting privatized. Uh, so while we move on, a quick uh, introduction to our speakers. Uh, we are very thankful to all our speakers and to introduce each of them. We have uh, Pradeep Krishan with us. He's the author of the books, Trees, uh, trees of Delhi, Jungle Trees of Central India, Abha Mahal Garden. And he has spent about 16 years working to restore degraded habitats, mostly in arid and semi-arid habitats in the desert, notably in uh, Jodhpur and also Jaipur. So thanks a lot, uh, Pradeep Krishan. It's a privilege to have you with us again. Uh, we did uh, have you speak at one of our webinars earlier last year too. Then we have uh, Sushma Ainger, who is the social uh, educator and worker uh, known for her work in the field of community empowerment and women's empowerment. She did her master's in literature from MS University Baroda and later on a master's in professional studies from Cornell University. After she returned to India in the 80s, she founded one of the early rural women's movement in India called the Kach Mahila Vikas Sangatan a women's collective and organization and its offshoot Kasab, a collective of uh, women embroidery artisans for and for more than three decades, she has uh, led transformative action with marginalized communities in the area of gender, gender justice, indigenous cultures, traditional livelihoods, local governance, and also uh, focusing on uh, the rehabilitation post the disaster. She's based in Kutch and she's also founded, co-founded the Kutch Nav Nirman Abhiyan, which is a district network of civil society organizations, Setu, which works on local governance, the K-Link, uh, which is an information communication technology organization, which uh, works to make ICTs accessible and applicable to development needs and also Kamir, a platform for craft artisans, which works with the ecosystem of their uh, crafts. And uh, she's uh, been the pioneer of many grassroots initiatives, which include the first community radio initiative run by rural women in India. And she's also piloted the first successful community run resorts in India, which is a Sham E Sarhat, uh, governed by the pastoral communities in Bunny. And, uh, you know, she's the advisor to the UK based Paul Hamlin Foundation for the India program. She's on the board of the Axis Bank. She's also a junk professor at the Center for Heritage Management at Ahmedabad University. And she has a number of publications, uh, notably, uh, which include the picture this painting the women's movement and living lightly journeys with pastoralists. And uh, Sushma is married to Sandeep Virmani, an environmentalist and architect, and they both live in uh, Bhuj in Kutch. Thank you so much, Sushma, for agreeing to be part of this discussion and uh, to share your thoughts. Uh, then we have Professor Purnendu Kaburi. Uh, beginning his academic life uh, as a student at, as of archaeology and history, over time he developed a very broad interest in anthropology and ecology. He obtained his PhD in development studies from the Institute of Social Studies at the Netherlands. 
Dr. Kaburi is well known for his pioneering research on pastoralist and nomadic communities of Western Rajasthan. Having a strong commitment to field research as well as teaching, he was until a few years ago at the Azim Premji University in Bangalore, where he taught courses in ecology and development for a decade. Following his retirement, he is now involved in setting up the digital plat uh, forum for uh, conversations on the commons called Indian Commoner and is a senior advisor to FES at Anand. Uh, last but not the least, he's also involved in setting up a non-profit organization in Rajasthan by the name Center for Social Ecology as a space for young researchers to explore and develop their ideas around ecological and development issues of which he is presently the director. Then we have uh, Nithyanand Jaraman. He's a journalist, a social activist from Chennai, and he's part of um, the many, many anti-corporate uh, campaigns uh, that operate from a collective called the Vetiver Kuta uh, Maipu. So thanks every one of you for making time and agreeing to be part of this webinar. I now request uh, Leo to give us an introduction to today's theme, uh, followed by a couple of uh, case studies and then I will take over. So the format of our presentation will be we'll share some of these stories. Alternatively, Leo will uh, talk about a few and I will talk about a few. And then we'll open up um, the space for each of our speakers today to share their thoughts from their own experiences and also draw uh, similarities, differences and the many other ways perhaps in which they have addressed the challenge of uh, what's happening to our commons. And after all our speakers have spoken, then we will open it up for the audience to ask questions. Uh, I guess uh, questions are also going to come through Facebook. Our colleagues, Ankisha, Anirudh, Kea, Bindu, uh, and all the rest of the team at uh, both INHAF and ESG uh, will be helping us. Uh, thank you so much and over to you, Leo. Uh, thank you, Bhargavi. Uh, Ankisha, if I can get the slides set. Yeah, thank you. Can we have the first slide? You'll have to do the slideshow and then say full. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, let's go to the next one. Please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so what I'm doing, going to do now is just to put some of the major uh, issues and concerns that uh, we always uh, end up facing when we work with the idea of the commons. Now, basically my argument here is that uh, uh, when you know human societies started uh, densifying into what were urban spaces, uh, a process that happened between five to 6,000 years ago or more. And the best evidence of that is uh, from our own uh, neighborhood uh, between what is today Gujarat, Rajasthan, Haryana and Pakistan, the uh, so-called Indus Valley civilization or the Arapan civilization. Uh, what we find is evidence of the fact that the commons were key to the success of those cities. And uh, uh, one thing that strikes me all the time is that these uh, cities, hundreds of them, uh, survived for a very, very long time. Uh, and always I wonder, with the, without the commons, could they have survived? And those structures which you see of uh, the, 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 uh, the, common, uh, the bath, uh, I've evolved over time and you can see the bowdies and the uh, wows of uh, bowdies of uh, Gujarat and wows of Rajasthan. Uh, this is, I think, a Gujarat uh, image here. Uh, and they also played a central role in how communities survived because water was central to it. And water was always seen as uh, accessible only uh, through the idea of protecting it as the commons. 
Uh, so there is a, there is a there is a sense that without a sense of community, uh, you cannot protect the commons, and without the commons, you cannot have community. So the two are intertwined. Uh, but it's not necessary that it was always inclusive and non-exploitative because there's widespread evidence of the fact that the commons were constructed in India on the backs of the labor of the Dalits by and large, and perhaps Adivasis. Uh, and the caste system played a fundamental role in making sure the commons were available for the upper caste and upper classes. And uh, if you look at the Mahat Satyagra of Dr. Ambedkar and the speech there, he reminds us then, and uh, this in three, four years time, in 20, uh, 2027, it will be 100 years since he gave that extraordinary speech, where to put it simply, he said, we don't have the rights to the commons that even our own cattle have, if you're a Dalit. And I don't think that's any different even today. Uh, just a few days ago, the uh, Poro Karmikas of uh, Karnataka, the Safai Karmacharis, as you call them, who keep our commons clean, struck work for several days. And it is after decades of struggle. And finally, the chief minister assured them that they will get their right to wages, right to employment, and all that secured. Uh, so you can see that even in today's so-called 21st century, the exploitation of Dalit communities is fundamental to protecting the commons. So there is this contradictory feeling that one has that while you want the commons to survive as a city or a village or whatever, it is also based on uh, you know, embedded exploitation. Uh, but there are also exciting features of the commons that we know without the commons, uh, without streets, for instance, cities would collapse. Uh, without street markets, cities would collapse. And without street play, life would be very boring. And we have seen what the lack of street play has done over the last two years, especially with the pandemic. Uh, but the question finally is, uh, with urbanization and climate change kind of colliding to create a, a situation which is unprecedented in human history, uh, how should we govern these commons? Because there is no argument against its necessity that's seen as necessary to the survival of human settlements. Uh, but how do we govern it? This is one of the most uh, biggest challenges we have contended with. And in the next set, set of slides, we'll be sharing some of our experiences quickly. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, next one. So we'll just start with what is the most obvious accessible commons that we have. When you step out of your house, you are into the commons, the streets. And one example of that is a street market. And uh, we worked with uh, Gandhi Bazaar, which is a street market in South Bangalore. And there was an idea to actually make it more accessible by pedestrianizing it and make it easier for people to shop and so on. But what we found was the tension between the traders who are embedded in the idea of property and uh, then the street where the idea of property was being challenged by the street vendors who had for decades, uh, literally almost lived on the streets, uh, selling vegetables and all sorts of things. So on the top, you actually see uh, photographs of uh, uh, Vanaja, for instance, who's holding a register, and uh, she's basically sharing the number of street vendors, about 250 street vendors, and they have a long history of being there. But the new city or the smart city or the emerging global city does not like them because they want malls, and there is this conflict. And so to resolve this conflict, uh, incredibly, the government of Karnataka, through uh, uh, support from GIZ and also Directorate of Urban Land Transport, proposed an idea of redesigning the street into uh, a pedestrianized street market. It was an idea made uh, five years ago, and we were uh, uh, consultants in building that idea. But what we did was the best form of the commons becoming the street and the street surviving is in Himfal, where the imas, the mothers, have organized the largest market by women anywhere in the world. Formally, there are two and a half to 3,000 women who uh, hold the market together, and informally, another 2,000 outside that space. The point is that without the market, Northeast, especially Manipur's economy, will collapse. So the street markets are so fundamental as an engine of growth and survival of urban areas. So what we did was we actually worked with them uh, in Gandhi Bazaar, took them to Ima Ketil, and brought them back. And we, what you see are some images of the planning that took place. We, we brought the member of parliament, we brought the MLA, the corporator to sit with us and try and see if we can have a sort of a convergence. It's not easy. It's very tough. And uh, the, 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 the contestations continue, but there is an effort to make it work. Next, next slide, please. 
Yeah, Barbara. Yeah, thank you. So. Um, as we move across uh, from the urban landscape to what is happening to the peripheral areas of the city, every one of these commons have been challenged over the last two and a half decades. This is a patch of forest that is contiguous with the Eastern Ghats, just outside of Bangalore on the way to Mysore. And it has a beautiful monolithic uh, rock which is popularly called as a Handigondi rock and because it looks like the back of an elephant uh, that is how it gets its name and unfortunately this was proposed to be turned into a 700 feet Buddha statue to replace the Bamiyan Buddha that was destroyed by the Taliban and the event itself uh, which helped raise money for uh, this huge um, project was supported by uh, our Bollywood uh, actors and actresses like Shah Rukh Khan and Rani Mukherjee who had a big event at the Karnataka Kantirava Stadium, not the Kantirava, the Chinnaswamy Stadium, the cricket stadium where, where, where they had this temptation 2005 when the entire city was blocked with traffic and long queues to attend that uh, event. It was only later we realized that that all that money that was raised which was several thousand crores was to uh, you know create this uh, kind of a city where one monolithic rock would be the Bamiyan Buddha and all each of the others in the area would be the bust of Ambedkar, Mahatma Gandhi, Indra Gandhi so on and so forth bird watchers of the area and uh, Bangalore luckily is home to a lot of bird watchers and rock climbers. They brought it to our attention and uh, we engaged with them, mobilized the local communities. We had several conversations with the forest department and the forest department initially would not budge an inch of uh, the kind of clearance and the permissions they had given to them. But because of uh, the public support, that entire huge rock that you see there on top was covered with a banner on one particular day of a protest that was chosen by everybody and uh, the banner read i don't need a faceless lift i am beautiful as i am and that caught the attention of a whole lot of people because it's just adjacent to the highway that pass goes to mysore it caught the attention of uh, journalists and various other people and it kind of embarrassed the forest department and the forest department withdrew that decision and today that uh, patch of forest is uh, protected as a sloth bear sanctuary it is also home to vultures and also the yellow throated uh, bulbuls out there so this was one of the earlier um, examples of how we had to engage uh, with uh, various kinds of local communities in protecting a small uh, forest. Can we go to the next slide? This is also about another patch of forest. So Bangalore around has a, a bunch of forest in the southern region. Um, and these are all contiguous with each other. So this Turali forest, which is again bordering the actually the what we call the nice road, the Bangalore Mysore infrastructure corridor road, it kind of borders that road. It is a, another beautiful patch of forest which has a lot of boulders. This is a place where uh, young people learn uh, rock climbing. And it had been protected by rock climbers, by the local uh, village panchayats and also people who graze their uh, cattle and sheep. And this is home to a variety of birds, deer, um, leopards. But this patch of forest has always been an, a, a patch that is again, you know, uh, the um, major, um, it's like a piece of cake for the real estate people the BDA included, uh, and also the forest department. So uh, sometime back, the land was encroached to make convert it into a layout, but we had to work with the BDA and the forest department and reverse that decision. Then it was the forest department wanting to give away this uh, piece of land to the jungle lodges and resorts to convert that into a resort where the common man can't go, but you can only go there like the Bandipur and Kabini and other places where you pay exorbitant rates to go see a forest and come. They wanted to turn this into a facility like that. But that again, with a lot of intervention, a lot of public support, protests, uh, that was reversed. 
then the forest department wanted to make it into a tree park so one part of the forest currently has been converted to a tree park where they've put in a whole lot of play equipment and they've created um, walking paths and they've put uh, equipment for a gym uh, they've also brought in some amount of all the uh, ornamental varieties of plants the wild look of that patch of the forest is gone but on the other side remains the old um, pristine forest which was accessible to rock climbers to um, students to researchers and a variety of other people who wanted to use that forest space in a very um, judicious manner but with all the big apartment com complexes out there the elite uh, apartment complexes they want that uh, space to be protected as a result nobody is allowed today and um, it, it is not even open for a simple educational purpose uh, it is not open for researchers um, everybody has to go through a series of uh, permissions to enter this forest and unfortunately all the pastoralists and the bird watchers and the climbers who had been protecting this space for such a long time today have to stay out of that place and uh, this is how the new conversation on protecting the forest is happening and uh, we have been um, constantly in conversation with the PCCF uh, trying to make some amendment so that uh, you know simple things like um, the local grazing community should be able to use it uh, educational purposes should uh, be able to reach this forest for experiential education uh, so these are some of the conversations we are currently having. Yeah. Uh, so I would like Leo to move on to the next two case studies. For people who know Bangalore, Kaban Park becomes the, uh, you know, Kaban Park is like the art of Bangalore. I mean, people talk a lot about Lal Bagh being a botanical sanctuary, but if there is a people's park, uh, that could be that would be Kaban Park, and in many ways it is also a political space. Uh, for a long time, uh, till at least the 90s, a large farmers gathering, trade unions would converge in Kaban Park. Uh, so it's not just the, the idea of a park is uh, in some ways not the right description for that space, uh, but it's also a space which kind of set apart the cantonment area from the traditional towns and pet area which we evolved over the centuries. So you can also imagine as a kind of a no man's land between the colonialists and the desis, uh, if you were to call that. But post-colonial period has seen the uh, park becoming a space which bridged the uh, two separate cities. And by the 90s, I think, you know, our idea of the park was, okay, you could go there to play, you could go there to protest, you could go there to hang out. That idea came under attack because there was this City Beautiful campaign. And uh, one of the first things that was banned was political protests. Uh, and then the legislators uh, actually thought that they could use the park for setting up a resort right next to the Vidhan Sauda. And uh, in fact, his first successful campaign was to resist that. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, they went on to build a smaller uh, legislator's home as they called it. Uh, but what it helped us understand was the palpable resentment in the wider public against the state monopolizing its power over the commons because the power is vested in law and the law is so written that it doesn't give the power to the people it gives it to the state and so there was a contestation of the kind of laws that had been passed in the previous decades which gave the state arrogated to state so much power over the commons that for instance it would deny the public access which you know which would be natural uh, naturally considered as part of your fundamental right. Uh, so in the late 90s, we stopped that. Uh, we, you know, hundreds of groups came together uh, for 40, 50 days, the protests went on. Uh, it actually resulted in a uh, reclaim your neighborhood park sort of campaign. And uh, Bangalore today has hundreds of neighborhood parks as a result of that. While that was there, a decade later, uh, the horticulture minister came back, came with a sort of harebrained scheme because this was the early days of uh, what we call now UID. Uh, and Bangalore has always been a testing ground for electronic this and electronic that. 
And so he said, why don't we have electronic ID cards for those who want to enter Kaban Park? Now, this is bizarre because the park is also a space where the LGBTQ community hangs out. Uh, it is also a space if you come on the weekend, the minorities, particularly the Muslim communities, love to use this space because unlike Lalbagh, which is ticketed, this is open. You can enter it in multiple from multiple spaces, and it's so really uh, unassuming a space. So the electronic ID was perceived by us as an early effort to communalize the space, uh, to commodify it, and to restrict uh, people. And there is a certain class, and there is also a certain majoritarian view that came uh, with it. That was resisted by popular protests, and the LGBTQ community, the Dalit community, and the Muslim community were primary uh, to the success of this protest. But now we have a newer challenge, and that is uh, to turn the park into a commodified space. Uh, the Bangalore Smart City project is uh, doing its bit to you know, dig it up and turn it, spruce it up into all sorts of uh, very tacky uh, stuff that they're slapping along the park that is being resisted by a lot of local people. But there's also a contestation. Some want it, some don't want it. But And then Swiss Next, for instance, you know, without really uh, explaining, called a public uh, uh, you know, what they called a stakeholder meeting. It's a term that was uh, first invented by the World Bank and they're stuck in bureaucracies. It has stuck in our uh, decision-making circles as if only those who have stakes have a hold over the space and those who don't have stakes. No, you see, who, these are highly politically uh, co uh, complex and uh, uh, in, in some ways very uh, uh, regressive terminologies. The term stakeholder to me always is a term used to exclude, not include. And then you say you're invited and then you give a one day notice. Now, then the question comes up, who is the Swiss consulate to decide how the commons of Bangalore has to be used, right? So then the questions of sovereignty comes here. So these are the type of challenges we now play, play and now recently Razor Pay, which is a company which actually, you know, some of you may, we also use it to raise donations. Uh, uh, they want to put up a unicorn. Uh, uh, to glorify Bangalore as the IT capital of India. So, you know, the idea of financialization and corporatization of space and commons and is so embedded in the way in which urbanization is administered today that to hold on to such wonderful spaces, uh, and it's a very interesting space. It's got wetlands, it's got woodlands, it's got just open ground. It's, I mean, you can really have a very, it's a very complex uh, habitat, actually. Uh, you really need to be vigilant. And sometimes, you know, it asks us, if we are not vigilant, will we lose our comments? Yeah. Next one, please. And that brings me to this. And it's it's really a small thing that we started. You know, uh, interestingly, we were driving back from somewhere, and uh, Bargavi and I noticed a tree was being felled uh, in the middle of Bangalore, and we asked for permissions. Like, and they said, "Why do you need permissions?" And then finally, our permission was shown, and we we were shocked to see that a beautifully. Uh, I mean, there's a beautiful uh, boulevard, uh, which popularly is known as Nanda Grove, which is three kilometer long boulevard. It's full of trees and parks. And uh, uh, city official had actually certified all those trees as weak and dying, and therefore they had to be felled. We realized it was a timber mafia then, and that uh, helped us set up the tree helpline. We resisted that successfully, of course. The tree helpline created a lot of people's, uh, you know, picked on a lot of interest, which was palpable, but it did not have a channel. And then that channel, you know, kind of exploded with activity. And uh, soon we had people calling it Asiru Usiru. And Asiru Usiru in Kannada means greenery is life's breath. So in a densely crowded uh, setting that uh, our cities are, if you don't have open spaces, if you don't have tree lines, if you don't have, I mean, we can all we can potentially all go mad. Uh, so it's part of a public sanity project that we should have these spaces. Uh, that's from an anthropocentric point of view, but from an ecological point of view, these tree lines are also spaces where wildlife corridors are active. Uh, a lot of birds move in those tree lines. And so there is a constant tension with these uh, spaces uh, in, in you know, sort of destroying the spaces, especially because of the type of infrastructure. I mean, our cities are actually uh, copying not even what the West went through in the 60s and 40s and, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the the era of big construction in America, uh, we are actually copying Dubai. We are copying Shanghai, and uh, to some extent, it's also because I remember uh, B. S. Patil was our inf infrastructure secretary for a very long time. He comes back from Shanghai about 15 years ago and says, at the airport when 
people asked him, what, what did you see there? He says, oh, we need roads like Shanghai. Of course you need, you know, 20 lane roads. Uh, and once 20 lane roads come, the city transforms. So to me, the tree lines and the spaces are critical to hold on to an idea of an inclusive city. Uh, it is not just about greenery. It is also a space where we uh, question infrastructure, question the nature of planning, question land use. Uh, and this has actually happened. We have had a successful steel bridge, uh, steel flyover beta campaign where thousands of people came out and said, and that actually resulted in the formation of Citizen for Bangalore, which is another formation uh, like Asiru Siru. So vigilant publics, uh, and the bottom right is actually a very interesting photograph I recently found. It's from 2005, when people troubled by the idea of road widening and infrastructure development said, you know, you can't build your way out of congestion. You cannot destroy the city. Uh, and they occupied the corporation commissioner's office and refused to leave. And we got locked inside. And we were there till eight or nine in the night. And somebody had to break the key uh, to the commissioner's office. I wish it happened today. Uh, because the Supreme Court, the High Court, every court is actually regulating where you protest, where you, how you interact with the government. There is no space to interact with the government. And I would like to say this. If you don't have the street as a space to interact with the government, be it through a protest, be it through a demonstration, whatever you want, then governance fails. And then it becomes tyranny. So I think it's not just about protecting trees and tree lines and so on. So it's much more than that. And this also speaks to the idea that without streets, you cannot have uh, you know, livelihoods. There's millions of livelihoods which are connected with streets. Thanks. Next one. Yeah. Yeah. So while uh, this, you know, the smaller urban uh, commons were being engulfed by a variety of these projects, the state government was eyeing a huge chunk of uh, the rural commons and Karnataka was home to some uh, 4, 4 lakh 70 thousand acres of uh, grasslands and these grasslands had special protection under the Karnataka Forest uh, Act. They were to be treated as district forests and this was way back during the Tipu Sultan times and later on the Mysore Maharajas took it over and that's how the protection was uh, got. Uh, Tipu Sultan uh, paid special attention to these forests, the, these grasslands, and um, that was because much of his cattle that supported his um, war uh, fed on the grass here, and uh, that was, he in fact called it the Benne Chavdi. So, since then, these grasslands had been protected for several hundreds of years and uh, about 65 to 70 villages live around these grasslands with absolutely no encroachment from the villagers they worship these grasslands they have a deity called the birappa there's also a film that we made some time back called the birappa's angst and they uh, came once or twice a year into these grasslands with their sheep and cattle and celebrated. They sang songs. There is so much of art and culture out there. And the language that in which they speak is a very unique language. It's like a mixture of Kannada and Telugu because some of them are the nomadic communities who traveled across the southern uh, region and uh, had settled down. There are also nomadic communities out there. And in such a beautiful uh, grassland came this uh, project of setting up a science city. And that meant loss of access to these grazing pastures. The communities who lived there had anything between, you know, households having five sheep to households having 5,000 sheep. And the women of the communities played a very important role because it was their, um, um, role of making the yarn and that's how they got a little additional income and it was the men who traditionally uh, did the weaving of the blankets and these blankets are so crucial and significant to uh, that entire community because when a child is born the baby is first put on a piece of that blanket woven specially for that or even if it's a final journey of somebody who's passed away you know a piece of this blanket is sent along with them that is the richness of uh, the local community out there and the local community depended on these uh, grasslands not just for uh, grazing but also for a whole lot of other um, materials like bamboo and um, building material for their homes 
uh, and they also had some patches of agriculture here and there where they grew uh, groundnuts. Uh, Chalkere, in fact, the city that got converted to the science city is, was the oil uh, uh, belt of Karnataka, I could say, because it produced so much of groundnuts at one point of time. So if we move to the next slide, we'll see the kind of allotments that have been given to uh, the various um, institutions so totally about 10,000 acres but it is definitely much more with a whole lot of other housing facilities that have come up and what is very interesting was if you see the kind of in uh, institutions that came up these are all the big ivory towers uh, institutions of India and they felt that they were above the law uh, the, they would not engage with local communities. They practiced a lot of violence uh, when the project came up. The local communities had no idea when these projects came up. It was a couple of helicopters which came hovering around and then one fine day they started building a fence and the local communities were stopped from entering into these um, grasslands and it was the women who protested and many women got beaten up and put into jail uh, by the police. So the, these institutions also employed a lot of uh, muscle power in, um, you know, bulldozing the rights and the dignities of uh, these communities. Can we move to the next slide? So what is very interesting is how the land got diverted. If we, when, when we did a whole lot of research on this, we found that there was a high court order which said that, you know, these lands cannot be diverted at any cost. If at all, um, it has to be uh, re-reserved for any particular um, reason. Uh, it, it, uh, it, you know, it's mostly if uh, they were very poor people, a small chunk of land would be given for them for a livelihood reason. So it read like what it uh, what is given below and what has been highlighted in green. It said if at all something has to be de-reserved and if it is for particular persons for cultivation, then the rule of um, the rule 97 of the Karnataka Land Revenue Act can be applied and some small diversions can happen. But the DC of the region at that point of time completely misinterpreted it. And you can see that paragraph on top where he says instead of de-reserved, he called it re-reserved and persons became purpose, any other purpose. And that's how the land was diverted. And when we dug out the records, we found that he had mentioned district-wise, taluk-wise, uh, number of cattle to be 5 and 11 and 12 and 15. These were the numbers that were recorded by uh, the DC's office. And that was what he signed saying that there are no Amrit Mahal uh, cattle in this area. So the Amrit Mahal cattle, another point is, are indigenous to this area, just as how we have the Thar Parker and uh, various other um, indigenous cattle. So Amrit Mahal cattle is indigenous it produces a special uh, kind of milk which is very nutritious it is not large in quantity each cow just produces some two or three liters but it is extremely nutritious and um, these cows also had uh, the ability to walk long distances and uh, they were uh, disease resistant they could withstand uh, without water for long periods of time and that was the reason this local community here had you know, um, taken it up upon themselves to breed these uh, cattle and ensure the animal genetic diversity was retained within the community. Every household you would see uh, Amrit Mahal cattle. And in addition to this, the area was home to the Great Indian Buster, the Lesser Floricon and also the Black Buck. But uh, the local governments, despite our engagement uh, through discussions, uh, accessing information through RTI, um, making representations, they just didn't seem to uh, address any of the issues and we were forced to uh, go to the court. So when we went to the court, the court set up a committee to look into the matter. 
at that point of time we wrote this um, report it's a very detailed report called the forfeiting our commons which has a very comprehensive report of the local communities their relationship with these commons their life what they produced and how they coexisted with uh, nature and the reasons why uh, such such a beautiful common should not be diverted and while we were writing this report we also bumped into another beautiful phd thesis of one uh, ganesh babu who had done his phd thesis on the chalkere grasslands and we found that he had uh, in his research he had found that there were some 11 endemic uh, grass species in this area see this is uh, something very crucial for food security given that you know all our food comes from grasses so what happened was when we went to court can we go to the next slide when we went to court uh, uh, we had to um, file two different cases one at the karnataka high court and uh, the other one was at the ngt the outcome was kind of fair because um what the courts basically said what ngt said was all these projects could come up only after they obtained necessary clearances but these organizations and institutions they felt that they are above the law and just went ahead doing what they did and the sagitor uh, solar company which had got about 1000 to 1500 acres that decision particularly uh, the um, ngt ordered moef to go back and revisit their decision about removing solar parks from the purview of um, the environmental clearance mechanisms but moef again did very little about it and today we see solar parks coming up on such beautiful grasslands not just in karnataka but across um, you know the west and southern parts of uh, india most of our open natural ecosystems are um, making way for the solar parks and uh, some of the court decisions also mention that these institutions have to ensure the local communities get water local communities should have paths to reach their places of worship because all of them had a variety of animistic uh, belief temples places of worship in these um, grasslands and what is very shocking is Uh, IASC bulldozed these temples which fell in their uh, premises. They also created a lake within their premises, not allowing the water to pass through to other uh, downstream lakes. And today, the community there has no livelihood. They have no skills to pick up alternate livelihoods, and it is a very challenging um, atmosphere out there. And in ten years' time, twenty years' time. all the indicators out there starting from malnutrition infant mortality maternal mortality all of this will definitely be very high so many many studies will be required and if at all a census is ever done uh, we will probably get to know the scenario yeah i will now request leo to speak about uh, the bt brinjal as the seed commons i i i see that we have uh, sort of exceeded our time limit so I'll just be crisp about it so basically the idea is to show that food which is our uh, which is the commons which is one of the first things that was commodified uh, during the wars and the post war uh, especially through green revolution uh, it continues to be a challenge to old food as the commons and the fact that proprietary rights over seeds proprietary rights over the food supply chain is now being so aggressively advocated probably met its best challenge uh, 10 years ago when jairam ramesh uh, organized nationwide public hearings on bt brinjal uh, whether the decision of the ministry to commercial uh, to allow commercial release was right or right or wrong in the bottom you see the former prime minister hd devegoda and uh, you are anand murthy was no more uh, the uh, you know uh, the writer uh, walking in as just ordinary citizens and trying to persuade uh, uh, the then minister to not allow this to go forward and uh, jairam ramesh uses the principle the precautionary principle to argue that it is best to put a moratorium on allowing genetically modified modified foods into our country why this principle is important is also because the same methods were 
food has been monopolized is also used to monopolize all forms of commerce. And we need to be watchful about how particular legal precedents can have widespread implications. Yeah, next one. Yeah, so I will quickly let Bhargavi go through a few slides and if we have time, we'll uh, speak about the details. Uh, but this is really about uh, the water commons and uh, maybe we'll try and wrap up in five minutes. Uh, yeah, I, I guess we can uh, move to the next slide. I'll... So we all know about how the large part of southern India depends on lakes and how lakes are interconnected with each other and uh, the fact that they are not perennial, they are seasonal. Um, we'll go to the next one, please. And it has supported a variety of livelihoods. Uh, so what happened was in 2002 in Bangalore, uh, the Karnataka government and in Bangalore, uh, the city corporation, all of them came together and they set up something called the Lake Development Authority. And this Lake Development Authority uh, privatized four lakes in uh, 2004. In 2002, the conversation started by, by 2004, it was privatized, despite a lot of public protests and, um, you know, a, a variety of uh, engagements and lobbying with all the authorities. So it was at that time we had to file a public interest uh, litigation. And um, we all know that, you know, how lakes are very important, not just for livelihoods, but also they are uh, great habitats for migratory birds and how they play a great role in carbon sequestration. Uh, but yes, the planning in Bangalore has really messed up these lakes because much of our effluents from factories and also switch from residential areas today is reaching these uh, lakes and the Rajakaluwe system has been completely destroyed. Uh, STPs don't uh, run properly. As a result, Bangalore is very famous for its lakes uh, catching fire as well and lake dependent livelihoods have been completely destroyed uh, in cities like Bangalore. So given all of this in uh, 2008, we filed a public interest litigation and there again, before filing the public interest litigation, like you see here, we got very eminent people from the city to come and participate in these protests and human chains and uh, sign on uh, campaigns and so on and so forth. The center picture is Justice Sadashiva, who participated in um, one of the protests and said that lakes should not be privatized. The picture of the uh, on the right is uh, she's a very famous Canada film actress. She passed away recently. Her name is Elvi Sharda. She had actually made a film called Kere Hado, means the song of the lakes. And she came and spoke to people. Uh, all of them joined hands, but despite that, it went on. And so as a result, we had to file a public interest litigation. The litigation has been ongoing for a decade and it's still going on, of course, with good results. And I would uh, like Leo to share the uh, journey in the court. Yeah, Anirudh, you can keep shifting the slides till we get to that Loktak thing because we're running out of time, but I'll just speak. Uh, so basically this is a case where we argue that the idea of the commons rests on the premise, uh, not so fast, just slowly. Uh, uh, idea of the commons uh, rests on the premise that uh, if they don't belong to everybody, they don't belong to nobody. Uh, and when you say they must belong to everybody, then the problem is what are the norms on which uh, we can have that. Uh, so when we went to the court, it was really to challenge the privatization of lakes uh, and handing them over to the, the Obirois, for instance, and many other private sector, uh, private corporations. And that was effectively a privatization of the commons, which would set a wrong precedent in law and governance. And so our effort was to tackle it uh, on the legal side, but also to advocate that the public trust doctrine, which the Supreme Court had upheld and made it part of uh, Indian law, uh, if it really meant anything, then this type of a model of uh, governing and maintaining our commons must go. And uh, luckily for us, if you can just slip to the uh, NK Patil report, uh, the court took an unprecedented decision. They asked a sitting judge to add a committee and provide recommendations. And the, this set of recommendations, uh, the uh, Justice N.K. Patil who added it, 
invited us to provide our comments and we provide we gave a detailed set of recommendations which he made a part of his report to the uh, high court and the chief justice made it part of the judgment which in turn transformed the relationship between people the state and the commons which was deteriorating quite rapidly we managed to turn it around and said if people are not involved in protecting the commons then commons will die anyway and therefore the state must as a servant of the people uh, behave in a way that it does not monopolize control uh, over these water commons and of course it is critical to groundwater security and uh, surface water security and as a wetland habitat and so on uh, so the arguments are quite uh, uh, too many for me to uh, paraphrase here but one thing you must uh, always uh, you know, read in this report is uh, this particular language. It is to be noted that any model involving uh, private public partnership wherein dominion over natural resources belong to the state is handed over to a private entrepreneur either for rejuvenation or for main management or maintenance. The same is likely to result in an anomalous situation requiring constant supervision by the state and its authorities and to ensure that there is no deviation from the stated policy or norm. So the relationship between corporatization and privatization of commons uh, is problematic. Uh, and we also have the problem of the sense of community in urban areas. How do you govern a lake or an area, as you call it in uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, if you don't have the sense of community? And is the, is the community integral in terms of the intent to protect this commons. So to resolve this, uh, we suggested a schema uh, which the court made part of their law and now it has become um, a part of their order and now it has become law uh, where district level lake protection committees have to be set up. And each and every district has the power to decide and resolve disputes on the water commons within that district. So there is no need for public to come to the high court anymore. Uh, so this alternate dispute resolution mechanism is also a mechanism to ensure that a judiciary, judicial and uh, a regulatory as well as administrative oversight along with public involvement becomes the system of protecting water commons. And as a result, 40,000 lakes, at least we got a count done recently through the court orders and uh, 40,000 lakes have been uh, uh, identified. Uh, we are now in the process of identifying ponds and other you know, water structures. So the basic argument is if you can think of thousands of years of investment of human energy in, uh, as you can see in this image, the interlinking of lakes and protecting a water landscape as the basis of you know, living, uh, why don't we return to that? Why do we need to dam rivers? Why do we need a Mekeda to dam or a dam downstream in Oganekal to destroy the Kaveri and bring water at enormous expense, which is you know, an irreversible damage? Uh, these rivers will die out. And then where do we go? Uh, so these are some of the questions that we are now bringing to the taluk level. We are holding taluk level workshops. Uh, and it's basically a model which is now available to any state to adopt. Uh, there are, it's not perfect, but it's an attempt to return the commons into the people's domain and ensure that the state, uh, especially the administration and regulatory setup, work to implement the guidelines. And they're quite very, very progressive guidelines. Uh, just slip to the next one. Yeah, these are all slides from the training program. I also want to acknowledge that, you know, uh, friends like Ram working with indigenous perspectives in Manipur are struggling to protect the Loktak commons, the Loktak wetland regime. Uh, it has a lot to do with the entire Manipur uh, economy. It's not beyond the ecology and uh, livelihood aspects and human rights, etc. And there is a very strong effort from Prime Minister Modi and uh, Chief Minister Biren Singh to turn that into the largest tourism destination. Uh, replete with golf courses. I mean, agencies like Wetlands International are supporting it. United Nations is supporting it. Only UNESCO is actually questioned it. Uh, so we really need to understand. I mean, this is one place where you can really see how people have lived lightly on this planet. Uh, when you go to Loktak, you are amazed by how little they take from Earth and how much they give back in terms of food uh, and other uh, you know, resources to the wider community. And it is this community which is now under attack from the kind of developmental agenda, uh, which has become mainstreamed. Uh, yeah. So that's, I think, the end of our presentation. We're sorry we took 10 minutes more than we should have. Yes. Uh, thank you, Leo. Uh, I now request uh, each of our speakers to come in and share your thoughts and from your own experiences. 
So I would first uh, request uh, Dr. Pradeep Krishan to come in and uh, speak. Um, hello, uh, Leo. I, I must say I feel very jealous in some ways uh, to hear about uh, some of the successes you've had. But at the same time, you know, I think we're facing a very, very depressing situation nationwide when it comes to, I mean, wherever you look in terms of the natural world, whether you're looking at, uh, you know, the, the FCA and the and protection of wildlife in wildlife places, you look at the desert and you look at, you know, you're getting Sutlej water, you're getting Himalayan water, for, you know, from the Sutlej to irrigate parts of Rajasthan. Uh, completely inappropriate ways of dealing with ecology that have absolutely no, uh, they don't make sense at all. I'm going to just give you a, a sense of, I'm going to give you a picture of something that's been happening in Delhi over the last six months. Because Delhi also in, in some ways uh, encapsulates some of these contestations. But it's also, it's also a place where it's much more difficult, I think, for, for citizens groups to actually have the kind of success that you seem to have had in Bangalore. Um, the central ridge in Delhi is remarkably something like eight square kilometers in extent. And for something that lies actually at the center of a huge metropolitan city, this is, this is really a remarkable thing. And the central ridge really was <clears throat> when it was first carved out and, uh, and you know, and uh, protected. This happened in 1911 when Delhi was, was New Delhi was first made the imperial capital and it was set aside as something that uh, the British called an amenity forest by which they meant that this was a forest in which the Barasabs would ride their horses through and it actually framed the, the city of New Delhi on one side. Now uh, on the one hand it's pretty remarkable that even though the forest department has lost control over something like a third of the eight uh, square kilometers of the forest, it still exists. But it's been reduced uh, over the years and you know, starting way back in the 1920s uh, into a forest that is almost completely dominated to the extent of maybe 90, 95% by an invasive tree called Pasipis juliflora, the Vilayati kicker, which we all know. I don't know whether Vilayati kicker is a big problem in Bangalore, but certainly in dry parts of, of India all over, it's a huge problem. And part of, the, uh, part of the problem is that nobody really looks after the central ridge. The, we've, had a, we've had a forest department uh, conservator, chief conservator say that you know, we don't look after it because it's there, it doesn't need anything, the trees are, you know, are, are, are doing well on their own and, they, and they're, they're acting as a, as a bulwark against the desert coming into Delhi. But the fact is, it's a, it's a dreadful, it's a dreadfully degraded forest. And there have been calls over many, many years now for, for the forest department or for some agency to come in and try and restore the central ridge uh, into a beautiful, fully functioning, dry, deciduous forest or a thorn forest. Now, the Central Ridge actually has a long history of people not knowing what to do with it, not knowing what to plant. Uh, in the first eight or nine years when it was first planted up by the British, uh, they did not use a single tree that was actually uh, adapted to thin soils, rocky soils, you know, in the, because this is all part of the Aravali. And as a result, the minute that they withdrew watering, they withdrew irrigation from the, what, what was planted, everything died. And that's when they actually first started using Prosopis juliflora as a means of trying to uh, green this area. And Prosopis then proceeded to do so well that it outcompeted everything else and completely dominated the ridge. Now, cut to uh, 2021, when the forest department uh, formed a plan to restore the area, and they asked a gentleman called Professor C.R. Babu, who is kind of a, the government's favorite botanist in Delhi, to, to spearhead uh, uh, the, uh, a plan to try and restore the ridge to what he called pristine glory. 
And as luck would have it, uh, as bad luck would have it for him, I was on a committee to, over to, to look at how this was happening. And he made a presentation to us and he said that, you know, we are going to restore the ridge to pristine glory, but we're going to make it like New York Central Park. And we said, what? I mean, New York Central Park is not a restored natural forest. And he was talking about having tennis courts and handball courts, if you please, and things like that on the ridge. We actually then kicked up a big row because we then realized that he was planning to create all kinds of water bodies on the ridge, uh, you know, completely change the moisture regime on the ridge to use uh, tree species which were found 800 kilometers south of Delhi on the Aravalis, but in, you know, in Rajasthan, um, <clears throat> which weren't, you know, weren't found in this area at all. And we realized that, in fact, the entire planning for this was, you know, which was done with the forest department, was just done in such a cockeyed way that um, it was a very frightening prospect, you know. Now we're seeing this, we're seeing this in Delhi at every level. You know, we see this with what's happening with parks. We see this what's happening in, the, you know, the ridge is just a one symbol of that. We were very worried about what was going to happen to the India Gate lawns because that was, you know, such an important public gathering place as well. That seems to have been saved. Uh, although there are other terrible things that are happening, you know, along that, that axis with, with, with government buildings. But um, let me just say for now, uh, Leo, that we, we don't, you know, I think that what's happened in Delhi is that we're much closer to the big levers of power, uh, the, the big corporates, the big sort of Gurgaon style, you know, development that, is, that has taken over and has become all the rage here. And I think that as a result, we probably have much less um, concerted civic action, uh, people coming together to sort of protest and actually make, make a dent in these things. So um, in general, uh, let me just say that I think we're in trouble in Delhi. We're in very big trouble. We're in big trouble with water. We're in terrible trouble with the quality of the air that we breathe. Uh, Delhi is projected to be something like 53 million people. Uh, I, I think in some particular year, not very far in the future. So dismal, dismal thoughts. Uh, and I'm sorry to end on such a dismal note, but that's, that's the way I see it from where, from where I am. Thank you. You've taken exactly 10 minutes. I uh, Sushma is not here. Uh, I now request uh, Purnendu to come in and share his thoughts. Thank you, Bhargavi. Uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting me here. And it's always a learning experience listening to the work that you're doing. I was lucky enough to go with Leo to the Amrit Mahal Kaval and uh, listen to his experiences in that particular area. And uh, yes, I will talk on uh, four or five points in response. First thing is, uh, you did mention animals uh, when it comes to uh, the Amrit Mahal Kavals. But one of the things I would say that is missing in your uh, conversation so far is animals in the city. And I do believe that in Bangalore, there are a lot of environmentalists now who talk about insect life and bird life and so on. But I think we should also start thinking about domestic animals in the city. If there is uh, one uh, type of uh, relationship that has been anthema to the imagining of the city in the developmental imagination. And I don't just mean today's smart city. We can go back to the Delhi of the 60s and 70s and 80s also. Is that animals, domestic animals, have never had a place in the way we see a city. Uh, getting rid of, uh, I happened to be living in Delhi in the 70s when I was a student in college and so on. And uh, one of the things at that time was getting rid of cattle, you know, what are called nuisance animals, stray cattle from the cities. I personally feel that India is one of those few countries where I believe uh, animals still form a part of 
our city life as we experienced it. Uh, I've lived in, in, in Bangalore for a while, but I don't know it as intimately as I know places where I've lived for longer periods. But I feel that, uh, you know, for example, one of the things I found about 15 years ago when I was doing some work in Rajasthan and Jaipur is that there were people who owned 75, 80 cows in the middle of the old city. When you go to the old city, it's a fairly crowded place. But this man owns about 80 cows. Every day they go out to pasture, as it were, which is to say they graze on waste or whatever it is that they graze on and they come back. Now, that kind of complex relationship that a city has with its animals is a very unique thing to our society. There are pigs in our city. The most under-researched animal in the livestock area in India is the pig. And the pig is very much a city animal. Uh, there is a, long ago, there is a Japanese friend of mine who did some work in Dhaka. He sat for about three months with a group of herders, not herders, uh, pig, uh, swine herds, you know, and uh, how they maintain their herd. They would go from one garbage dump to another garbage dump, grazing at night. And those animals were maintained on what was called waste products. And in Dhaka, so you had a viable system of uh, pig production in the middle of a big city. Now, what I'm trying to draw attention to is that our imagining of the city, especially in our smart city model, is very slick and clinical and clean. We have no space for confusion. We have no space for messiness. The keeping in my childhood, I remember uh, poultry being a part of the city. I don't see poultry anywhere. The only animals we see are our dogs, you know, uh, and maybe some cats. Uh, in, in the old parts of the city, you will still find goats and sheep. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that these animals are, of course, stall fed. There is a certain amount of uh, food that is fed to them, but they survive not only in that form. They survive because they have space to move around. And those spaces are not formally designated spaces. Those spaces are informal spaces where people accept that there will be a cow, there will be a goat, there will be a hen, there'll be pigs moving around. You may not always be very comfortable, but you learn to tolerate those spaces. They move around that. And that kind of commoning, that kind of commons is not a designated space like a park or a lake. It may be that also, but they're informal transient spaces that come at certain times in the year. They may come after the festival. And in that sense, when Leo was talking about streets, I find that to be very important part of our conversation, that commons are not permanent entity, commons come and go. They may come seasonally, they may come uh, for maybe a few years and then disappear. Many building sites, I am a student of pastoralism, I find that in urban areas, I find sheep and goat grazing in the big cities, in plots, industrial plots. So there is a negotiation going on. I think if we can use animals as some kind of a litmus test in our imagining of the city, it will help us rethink what can be a city and what can be the nature of commons in the way we imagine our city beyond that highly so-called organized uh, kind of framework in which there are clean cities. Now, in fact, uh, Harappa may not be uh, an excellent model for us to think about. Uh, which brings me to my second point, and I think this is a little bit abstract, but it's fairly commonsensical. Uh, when you go from where I live in Bangalore, which is Kengeri, to the airport, you need to have a driver who knows more than just one route, right? Because that one route can be blocked. A good driver will know three to four routes, so he can get there. What I'm trying to get at is that commons in cities also mean that you have large amounts of information and large amounts of redundancy in the movement of people. You can get from one place to another place by five different means. Those five different means can mean different kinds of spaces, different kinds of grasses, different kinds of garbage, different kinds of shade, different kinds of rest. The more we rationalize our planning and thinking of the city, the more we lose in terms of information content. So designated common spaces are important,
but non-designated common spaces, which I believe are tied up with the complexity of our urban spaces. Old cities are very complicated. If you go to Ahmedabad or you go to Old Delhi or even you go to some other part in the south, maybe it's an old Hyderabad city, you will find a lot of complexity. New cities have less complexity and therefore I believe uh, the space for uh, commons becomes then restricted to defined spaces of commonly, which then become targets. When undefined spaces are there, they are harder to target and appropriate. So this is something I just thought I would uh, like to draw attention to in the sense that complexity is a necessary condition for commons to exist. When we start thinking, especially in urban context, when we start simplifying our structure, highways and no other way, I think commons don't form a part of that, uh, that structure because commons no, are not an either or space. There are always graded spaces, some more common, some less common, some seasonally common, some permanently common. So this whole graduated nature of commons is something that I wanted to uh, uh, point out too. The third point I would like to touch upon, and especially with regarding to commons, and is that we have been thinking of commons, the value of commons in terms of their productive value. Our whole philosophy, the way we look at life itself, you know, is tied up how can we demonstrate the value of the commons, especially when we are working in rural India. Hmm? Uh, as to they produce firewood, they produce fuel, and these things perhaps do exist. But there is another sense to which I believe commons are important, which is what I would call reproduction. That is spaces, not just for recreation, but spaces which provide opportunities for human beings to grow, for children to play, for people and women and men to interact, not without any productive purposes, but they are part of the way human beings reproduce their society, their culture, their spaces. So we need to develop a vocabulary around reproduction in the broader sense if we have to start developing an imagination of the commons in the city. Uh, at a penultimate point, and which is something that uh, was touched upon by Leo, is the question of embeddedness. Uh, historically, commons have been embedded in particular kinds of social structures. We should not pretend that these are egalitarian. They are not necessarily egalitarian. It may be that people have had differential access to common resources historically, the point is that uh, diversity in our society is usually embedded in power relationships. So when we start talking of commons, even today, I think we do need to uh, figure out that we will always have to deal with the problem of embeddedness and power uh, being something that has to be negotiated. You can't uh, have an imagination in which everybody has access to the same thing. The whole question of who's kept out, who's kept in, and whether it is the point about Dalits, and I accept that particular point that you made, it is something to be alert to. Uh, one should not start thinking of commons as egalitarian spaces. They are spaces which are uh, regulated in sometimes graduated ways, and we need to critically uh, think about this. Lastly, I want to ask a simple question. Are we commoners? To what extent are we commoners? Now, the thing is the word commoner today has sort of been reduced to some kind of a statistical term for a common man, you know, average kind of person. That is really not how we, we need to reinvent this whole vocabulary of commoners. I think our society today, India, as and in a general sense, even our broader metropolitan societies today, we are much more dependent on cultures, practices, and values of commoning that we don't really realize. Rarely do you find an individual in our city, except maybe an electronic city or somewhere, where uh, relationships in neighborhoods, relationships uh, with maybe even markets, shopkeepers are not mediated through non-commodity relationships. Non-commodity relationships still continue 
to shape many of our production and commodity relationships. And to that extent, uh, we engage in aspects of commoning, uh, getting together, organizing yourself, and fighting, struggling to bring together legal changes in the way the state functions and operates is fundamentally important. That is the spirit of the work. But I think we also need to start making people get into conversations because we are so completely alienated for the fact that we are commoning, constantly commoning, that we have stopped thinking of ourselves as having an inheritance of commons in our own culture and in our society. So that is really what I thought I would uh, like to share. Leo and Bhargavi, thank you once again for uh, your uh, presentation. I enjoyed listening. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Purnendu. Um, I will now request uh, Nityanand to share his thoughts and then we can uh, open it up for discussions. Uh, thank you, Bhargavi and Leo and uh, uh, Pradeep and uh, Purnendu. Um, so I have a slightly more fundamental question because in the beginning of the conversation, there was a suggestion that the urban has certain problems because of, of unplanned, unmanaged or ill-managed urbanization. And my question is uh, whether that is the case or whether the nature of the urban itself contains these inconsistencies, these problems uh, where, um, you know, it, 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 it uh, relates negatively with the commons and with uh, people who are people, economies, and cultures that are dependent on the commons. Is the urban sustainable? Urban as a special con uh, concept, which is what it largely is. I think that when we celebrate the urban, we talk about the cultural concepts of the urban, but at the root of it, it is essentially a special concept that talks about an increase in the built up area in any given space is what uh, urbanization is all about. So if that is the case, then why is urbanization happening? Is it responding to a need and the aspirations of the poor or is it responding to the aspirations of capital? Because that will decide on whether urbanization can be uh, a, a dog that we can wag by its tail. Um, my sense is that urbanization is something that we try quite helplessly to wag by its tail. Uh, it is something that is well beyond our forces. About um, four months ago, November is when we just had, we were planning to have a, a, a webinar uh, no, we are planning to have a seminar, a real seminar, you know, like the old times where we meet each other and actually speak face to face in uh, uh, MIDS about the idea of whether Chennai can grow without hurting itself. And uh, of course, that webinar had to be uh, uh, converted into a, that, that seminar had to be converted into a webinar because rains intervened. And when it rains in Chennai, it floods. And so we had this whole uh, uh, you know, meeting that was uh, turned into a webinar, and there was a very interesting presentation by uh, Sri Watson, who's a urban planner and an architect, um, and he said that as long as there is economic growth, which means investment coming into the city, there is nothing that can be done except for quote unquote better management. Uh, what that means, I really don't know. It just means that, you know, I think that uh, getting getting beaten up is get better than getting killed uh, kind of a situation. Um, what we need to realize is that when we are looking at the urban and the protection of the urban and the urban commons and looking at a more sensible urban, uh, we are forgetting that the urban's footprint is well beyond the borders defined by the Metropolitan Authority. Um, the, for instance, you know, Chennai's, uh, commons, the um, let's say the Pallikarne marshlands, which are a sprawling kind of a wetlands in the southwestern part of uh, Chennai, they have largely been uh, sacrificed to the IT corridor, uh, which has connections to almost all the major metropolises in the 
in, in, in the world. So you have a footprint of New York inside Chennai and eating, or eating into our commons. And I think that it is very difficult for me to influence Chen in New York's city policy because its city policy is something that is separate from the economic policy, which is a global kind of an economic policy. Over the last, say, 15 to 20 years that we have been working uh, in Tamil Nadu, uh, we have noticed that almost all the projects that are quote unquote development projects and now increasingly uh, conservation, climate adaptation, climate mitigation projects are projects that are targeting our commons and targeting not just commons, but what we are broadly calling as the Porambok. The Porambok is a very beautiful word. Uh, it's a word that uh, you know we share with Kerala, Andhra, Karnataka, and Tamil Nadu. And uh, this is an ancient Tamil word, which basically means lands that fall outside the revenue register, where the king or the crown or the government does not exact revenue from these lands. And these are lands that are communally used. Uh, and of course, you know there are, there, it is a very negotiated space. So what both Leo and Purnendu said are absolutely true, that it is not an egalitarian space. But the interesting part about the Purambok is that it has very strong laws governing it. One of the rules is you cannot build on it. The second rule is that you cannot buy or sell, which means that it is not property in the strict sense of the, uh, of, of, of the, of the word. And if it is not property, then it is virtually worthless to capitalism. And so in the British property making agenda, the Purambok became a huge problem and it's, it's, it's meaning in Tamil from being a communal, communally uh, owned and shared space to uh, becoming a pejorative was largely connected to the fact that it was worthless to the crown in terms of the agenda of property making. Um, you fast forward now, I think that legally Purambok still enjoys all the protections, but culturally the word has degraded. The commons have degraded. So now almost in the last 10 years, when you're looking at the projects that are coming up, it might be the eight lane expressway that we have successfully stopped. When I say we, I'm talking about people in various communities in various parts of the state, of the state uh, have stopped this eight lane expressway uh, port in, in uh, northern part of Chennai, another port, large uh, container terminal that's supposed to come up in Kanyakumari. All these were campaigns that were uh, fought against um, against um, you know, land use change, against conversion of the Porambok commons into privatized areas. So when I say urban commons, I would not look at urban commons as commons that are located within the boundaries of a city, because this urban is supported by the container terminal in Colombo or the container terminal in Kanyakumari. And so there is a definite connection between these two. And what we are also looking at is a clash of values a clash of values that where the built space is valued over the unbuilt space. The infrastructure of commerce is valued over the infrastructure of survival, the infrastructure of biodiversity. So if you look at Purambo Commons, these are lands or spaces that feed the bottom, uh, you know, uh, 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 majority of, of, the, um, of the economy. But these are also places that are biodiversity refugia. And yes, as Purnendu said, you know, the even, even, even abandoned factory sites like the Bhopal factory site is right now, the Bhopal Union Cupboard factory site is actually a very vibrant kind of a, a hotspot, a biodiversity refugia because it has been left abandoned, left untouched, not just untouched, but also used in different ways. Because in Bhopal, what we are finding is the walls have been broken down and the land has been used for grazing by surrounding communities. There are, so there are sheep grazing inside this contaminated sites. Um, so that's an, another um, issue about it. So this whole thing about private versus commons, built versus unbuilt, infrastructure of commerce versus infrastructure of survival, this keeps coming up time and again. I mean, looking at the city itself, I'm kind of divided about civic action because I find that a lot of the civic action is hugely problematic because a lot of the civic action is, is kind of driven by uh, a sense of aesthetics as uh, environmentalism. What, you know, uh, Amita has also talked about this bourgeois environmentalism. So that is something that, you know, comes up time and again in protection of commons, 
both in terms of development and in terms of conservation, we are finding increasingly enclosures uh, and exclusions that, that result. Um, so I would uh, you know, argue that if you're looking at urbanization as something that is very closely linked to growth, then growth itself is a colonial concept that requires uh, places where we can extract material resources, energy from, and places where we can dump to. Uh, dump in. So, which means that city as uh, uh, an engine of growth essentially is a discriminatory, a, a discriminatory colonizing space. So then do we really want that? Can we be, can we look at the cultural concepts of a city that we celebrate and see if that can be Gone by something, some other means. Can the concept of growth be challenged using cities as the prime example of how growth cannot be equitable or environmentally sustainable? Can we look at post growth uh, imaginations from a city, which means can the city shrink as a means of carving out a new, uh, you know? economic social um, model. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Niti. So we will now open uh, the floor for questions from the audience and other uh, panelists and also the organizers. Uh, it has been uh, very thought provoking, starting from uh, where uh, Leo started off and gave an example of how Gandhi Bazaar, a market was being planned. This uh, market actually lies in a very uh, elite neighborhood of uh, Bangalore. And if we go back to the planning of Bangalore, Bangalore's early planning definitely uh, had discrimination embedded in it. It made sure it kept certain sections of the society in the periphery of that planning. Uh, it was the upper class and the upper caste who were at the center of all that planning and who got the, you know, the major part of the kick. So starting from there to what is happening with um, Prosop is taking over in many parts of uh, these kind of commons. This is something we have also seen in Ch uh, Chalkere where with the uh, loss of uh, animals grazing the grasslands, Prosopis has just taken over everywhere. It today looks like a Prosopis forest. Uh, we just visited that 10 days ago and those images are fresh in my mind. And then talking about animals and the space for them in cities is a, another very interesting um, point that Purnendu made. Uh, in Bangalore, again, just about a couple of months ago, in a place where we worked, where we helped uh, stop, um, um, shut down two landfills, we saw some of the villagers who have now shifted to stall farming of um, goats and sheep and poultry, everything is being uh, stall farmed. And this is a very disturbing uh, site where we also learned that many of the animals died because of a variety of infectious diseases and not having access to the kind of uh, nutrition they otherwise would get. And then Niti spoke extensively about uh, the Purambok and uh, the idea of the nature of the uh, urban um, commons itself. So we will now open it up for discussions. Uh, Leo, would you have any um, thoughts to st start off the discussion? Well, I think uh, just a couple of points to be made because I think it's very good that the role of animals in our life has been brought out very powerfully by uh, Purnendu. And I see in the comments that uh, Amita Bhaviskar has also shared a couple of studies, which are uh, excellent studies on the role of pigs in shaping the city and our life, you know, our life itself, and also uh, what cows do to us. Uh, in fact, uh, Bangalore thankfully still has a lot of cows, and I see that in Delhi as well. I don't see that so much in Bombay, uh, maybe because it's a kind of an island and cut off from the uh, interland in a, a fundamental way. Uh, the idea of a city to me is not one where it did not have cows when I grew up, where I grew up. It was the old city. In fact, uh, my neighbor had four or five heads of cattle and uh, uh, 
it was almost assumed that this is how the entire city is as I grew up as a kid. Uh, but when I, when I started moving out into other neighborhoods, I realized the old sanitization mentality that comes uh, with it. And you, you really have to think of the role of caste here. If you have to have animals as part of the matrix of living, you need to be in an inter-caste, inter-class neighborhood. If you are in an elite neighborhood, it's forget it. Uh, to such an extent that apartments today have rules about how dogs are walked and when they are walked and you know whether you can have a dog or a cat, you need permission. You know, this type of sanitization of the mind and the spirit of living is extremely uh, dangerous. Uh, of course, it's dangerous in terms of our own sanity, but I also worry about another form of uh, problem that it presents. And that is that when you're not in touch with animals, our capacity to tackle zoonotic diseases comes down. And I guess, you know, if you look at evolution of humanity, uh, there must have been hundreds of zoonotic diseases, but uh, we need to worry about what hyper-sanitized neighborhoods will do to us as what COVID has shown to us, right? This is one problem. The other problem is also that the way in which our commons are being destroyed and aggressively taken over. And here, I think the financialization of the city, if there's one universal phenomenon that is destroying the commons uh, and the idea of a city or the space uh, where people live, is the fact that it is the intense financialization and speculative financialization, uh, which is uh, compromising the rights of the majority. So the elite dominates through finance today, what they did in the past through caste or class and access to political power and so on. And interestingly, animals bring, bring, us, bring us to see this complexity and uh, the simplification of this complexity, which is so, uh, you know, wrong and dangerous as well. Uh, and I was reading last week an article about how New York is bringing animals back to graze its parks. Uh, here we are keeping our animals out uh, and trying to demonize them. Uh, but then again, I want to ask, look at what's happening to our villages. The entire attack on beef eating, which, uh, you know, so, so many of us eat, uh, the whole protection of the cow has destroyed farming because the farmers are not able to maintain their farms because of feral livestock. And they're just coming back and eating food crops. So farmers don't have support of the state and here they have also the cattle which have turned on. I mean, what else will cattle do? They need to eat. Uh, so there has been some, you know, when you talked about piggeries, uh, for instance, we work with the waste management sector here and we find that the, at least 40% of the waste which is produced in Bangalore is so-called bulk generation uh, from institutions. And there is a rule that all of this should be sorted out as it is you know, sort of disposed uh, so that the food waste goes to piggeries. And uh, there are large figury farms in Bangalore where this food waste, which is uncontaminated with chemicals or mixed with other things actually goes in a pretty nice way to the piggeries. And uh, a lot of the pork which is supplied comes from there. And I would like to argue that, you know, what if we actually think of our parks and open spaces and trees and other, you know, why don't we grow trees which our cattle can be fed with, uh, the leaves of, or the goat can be, you know, jackfruit trees, why don't we see them, for instance, which goats love to eat. Uh, so these are some ways where we can humanize and animalize our uh, urban spaces. Uh, yeah, so these are some thoughts. And uh, I guess we have spoken about embeddedness of power uh, quite a bit in multiple ways. Uh, so, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there are a couple of um, questions that um, Ankisha has uh, put into the chat box. This is from Poonam Varma, who's raised uh, some interesting points. Uh, then we also have um, Dipani Sutaria. Uh, Dipani, would you like to um, ask your questions and uh, share your thoughts. I think. Yeah. Uh, Dipani, can you hear us? I have allowed her to talk. You can unmute yourself. 
Hi. Yeah, I just I live in a very bad internet zone though, so I won't put my video on. Um, I I I think I've read quite a bit, which everybody will be able to read. But uh, and I am sending a longer question in. But the forest one is just a very general ish general uh, question that I had earlier on. You know that we have a good panel here, and can we come to some kind of uh, some kind of agreement on what? what an urban forest or what a forest is um, because everybody takes their own call on this based on their agendas you know the landscape architects say something else the urban planners say something else the municipal corporation say something else the campus says something else and it would be really nice if a community could come out there write something about this um, whether they are the restoration ecologists or um, people like pradeep or you know anybody else in this field where they feel the community local community should also like grazers should also benefit from these areas so then you know let's come up with something that we can uh, we can have a foundation you know a strong foundation uh, and argue from when it comes to things like miyawaki plantations do we still should we still be allowed to call them forests so that was what my original question was about the first one thank you deepa uh, yeah. Pradeep, I think uh, you should take that. Yeah, well, I don't think a city forest needs to be a sort of one size fits all situation, Dipani. I think that I think that every ecology needs to celebrate itself. You know, so if you're dealing with something uh, in an arid part of Rajasthan, it probably needs to be that a city forest can be a shrubland and not a forest at all. I think that I think that the idea is first of all that city forests need to be sustainable, and part of the problem that we've seen in Delhi all over is that we don't have sustainable plantations. They're they're so busy planting exotic, thirsty, evergreen trees, and they and thereby having to sort of water them and give them nutrients and you know and actually create something completely unsustainable. But we do have something like two thousand parks uh, and gardens in Delhi, which is a remarkable fact, and a, a huge number of city forests that don't really function in the way they should. So there's a real opportunity. The ridge itself is also not a great opportunity to make to make a city uh, park of, of huge extent that would actually celebrate its own natural ecology. And this is not something that this is not something that the, either the forest department or municipal agencies in Delhi know how to do nor are they interested in actually reaching out and saying look we, we need help can somebody help to to you know to tell us how to do this in a way that is actually going to be because i personally believe that the the central ridge forest potentially 8 square kilometers in size could be one of the most beautiful uh, public forests of any capital city anywhere in the world you know it's an enormous opportunity but we're watching it slide by uh, because the people who are, you know, people in the forest department are basically just doing all the wrong things. And, <clears throat> and uh, you know, I, I was on a committee to oversee this to start with, and because I objected, I was removed. And that typically is how it, how it happens uh, with the powers that be. But, uh, you know, I, I don't think that a city forest needs to be um, defined in such a way that it... Um, that, that there's only one kind, Dipani. I mean, I think that city forests, um, I've seen a city forest in, uh, in Oslo in Norway, which had a frontage of about half a kilometer, but it extended for 150 kilometers backwards out of the city, you know, thereby actually, you know, broaching a very interesting new idea that you could actually have a vast space that only had a tiny footprint in the city, but extended outwards and backwards in such a way that it was became something that people could could walk in or or ride bicycling bicycles in for huge you know huge distances um, i think that every city uh, has a local ecology even within a city you can have micro habitats that are very different from each other. You, we see this in Delhi. Delhi has at least four or five distinct microhabitats, and they don't need to be like each other. They just need to be, you know, suitable to uh, the particular kinds of soils and moisture regimes and tree species that exist there. 
Yeah, agreed, agreed. But we don't have any policy documents at state level or national level talking about what you just said. And also that uh, sustainability is not included in the creation of plant, green plantations or new urban forests or any of that. We've done research and there's no policy document anywhere. So No, absolutely. The, see, the, yeah. the, the problem is the problem is that both at the level of our municipal horticultural agencies and at the level of the forest department, uh, there are severe shortcomings in the way they are trained, in the way they think, in the values they have, in their practices. You know, and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm tired of saying this, but you know, you, there really needs to be a huge change in the way these people are trained and, 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 and taught how to do the work they do. But it's, it's very pathetic quite frankly, uh, at this moment. And you can't expect more because of the shortcomings that exist. Yeah, uh, Diti, uh, please share your uh, thoughts on that. Yeah. yeah so I, I just think that, you know, we keep talking about the city, the only redeeming factor for the city is that it provides some kind of support for people who have been driven, uh, driven away from Chalikare or other places where the city's colonization has really, you know, degraded the commons. So then the city has to make sense for the poor. A city forest then by definition will have to make sense to the poor, which means it cannot be, it cannot be um, experts in the, uh, in the, in the traditional, uh, you know, uh, sense of the word that are taking a decision on how, what a city forest is or what a city, wild spaces, but it must be people who come from a variety of different uh, backgrounds. For instance, if you look at the city of Chennai, there's, we have a very large community of Narik Koravas. Uh, they are generally called uh, gypsies. They're nomadic tribes. And they um, also, uh, their diet includes a lot of the urban wildlife, feral life, etc. I mean, their point of view is generally not taken into consideration when you're looking at it because our sense of aesthetics, our sense of morality interferes with their way of life. So what I'm saying is that it might be good to look at a definition or not definitions, but or at least um, you know criteria for uh, city spaces. And I would not separate forest spaces or uh, wilderness spaces from non-wilderness spaces because the wildlife does not know one from the other. But how do you look at a city as a space that makes sense for the poor? It does not right now. It makes sense for capital. And I think that we need to be able to ad address that. The second issue that I had to kind of highlight is that a lot of times in the interest of you know, cooling the city, of increasing the water balance, et cetera, we have a number of technical intervention, technical interventions that end up as maladaptations. Uh, this is something that the IPCC report also talks about. And these maladaptations fall heaviest on the marginalized communities of the city. So if there is one project that we could all kind of commit to is to see how we can redefine expertise, how we can create spaces for other voices which are not heard to be heard, not just to be heard, but also to be listened to because people don't know how to listen. So I think that that is also a culture that needs to be brought in. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, doing that would be very important in, if we are to ever come to a consensus that is, uh, that makes sense for the poor um, on, uh, you know, what a forest should be or what a city should be or what a rural area should be. Thank you. Thank you, Neti. Um, should we do Kirti and then Leo? Oh, no, sure, sure. Kirtisha, please go ahead. No, I, I, I just, I just have a small little question for, for everyone. And uh, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, you are right. You are okay. audible, yeah. Okay. Now, what, what I was trying to kind of say was this: that I time and again do this, you know, in the context of. Uh, uh, policies and programs which are inadequate or insufficient or futile, like say, for instance, on the last question, can you think of Mumbai 
without slum, say, 10 years down the line? Would the current policies would, would solve it? Or you ask questions that, you know, can you think of a city where land prices go down, not go up? Or can we think about a city which is not water deficient, but water surplus? And you could kind of go on asking this question. In that particular framework, I essentially have a question for all of the panelists. And that is this. Is it possible to draw an alternative scenario of Bangalore, for instance, or even alternative scenario of, of Moscow, where animals live with people, where commons are preserved, not to not encroach upon and destroy, where it's an integral part of living settlements, where cities are not engines of growth, there's something else. Their land is not in the hands of land mafia and, uh, and, and, and profiteers, where rivers could flow uh, 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 on their own without, I think, you know, destruction, without pollution, etc. I was the reason I'm saying is this that you know, it probably Leo will be very interesting, even if if it's theoretical, even if it's a, it's, it's a model, if you could put this together. And the reason I'm saying is this that these are uh, absolutely important, very valid concepts and ideas, and I think you know uh, if you're really thinking about cities thirty years down the line. All this must get into kind of mainstream. Uh, and if it not doesn't get into mainstream, they really kind of you know uh, must be talked about months uh, developed models. So uh, uh, I thought you know, I'll ask this: that is it possible uh, where uh, where where one could work upon this? You know, in terms of what the scenario would be like in, in this particular context. And, and this question to. Anyone want to answer? Pradeep, Leo, Niti, Purnendu, anybody who wants to take that? I, I will start. I, I, I hope the others will join in. Uh, I just want to say, I mean, Kirti, you actually have uh, not raised the question of building utopia. It is actually about reclaiming the cities that we grew up in. And you would probably have more inside there because you've been longer on this planet than I have been. Uh, but when I was growing up, I did not see, we have a river called Vrishabhavati. Uh, we now call it Vishabhavati, which Visha means poison. Uh, so one which is life giving has now become a poisonous river and it drains the almost the entire west of uh, Bangalore. And then that river goes and feeds water into the Kaveri uh, and unfortunately, uh, the people of Tamil Nadu have to drink that. This has been the cycle of violence. It's, it's a very violent uh, cycle that our cities have set up. Uh, and violence is not really, you know, you know, violence has to be understood in multiple ways. Uh, but what I want to say is that if we were to really think of the future and really worry about what and deeply, and I, I write about it, it requires much deeper thinking about how do we reclaim the cities and make the Vishabhavati become Vrishabhavati, like we have actually succeeded in reclaiming 11 lakes now, uh, which were all gone. Uh, uh, we are in the process of uh, recovering another 50, 60, 100 lakes very soon. Uh, but this required a lot of work over two decades almost. And almost non-sexy work, I would say. And there's no support for this. Uh, when civil society works, this type of work, most funding agencies don't support. So you have to raise your own resources. Suppose you go to court and argue cases, you don't find, find lawyers who are consistent with that. And you need to do that because the law has been manipulated and used against the commons. It has been used to impose the developmental uh, plus communal majoritarianism uh, and it is being imposed across the landscape. And the commons are the first sites where you see it. 
Uh, more recently, there was a very, very uh, we call it the Yidga Maidan. And suddenly, you know, nobody had any conflict over it because everybody knew that's where the Muslim go and pray. But suddenly the Hindutva groups decided that that's where they want to do yoga uh, camps when uh, Prime Minister came recently to Bangalore, which was stalled. And then they now want to do a Ganesh Utsav. So you see, the communalization of the commons is also a project of uh, creating the fascist state. So this is one aspect that I think we must all be alert to and it requires, I don't think most people uh, relate with this ideology, but most people don't have the time to worry about it. And that to me is a very serious problem. And that is used as an opportunity to take away the commons. And I've seen hundreds of commons which are uh, sort of communalized with a particular religious identity. Uh, suppose a Buddhist mo monastery came or a Muslim, uh, you know, a mosque came, it would be disastrous for them. But then you will see hundreds of temples. That is why, for instance, the Supreme Court in 2009 started with Gujarat and said, you know, just because the majority is Hindu doesn't mean every common area has to have a, a temple. And it's also not true that is how it was in the past, though it is always the uh, sort of... Uh, Song, song that is sung nowadays that so much destruction of uh, temples took place, etc. My The other point I want to make is that, you know, there was a question about policy and uh, Pradeep actually raised the uh, idea of, you know, you cannot have one sweep in policy, uh, be it for urban or any forest, because forests as a, are uh, as a, they're as complex as they naturally are in, in, in terms of defining it. So, but then we should also realize that there is no, it is wrong to say we don't have a policy. Local traditions are a form of policy. And we have the Biological Diversity Act, which acknowledges that, uh, that traditional knowledge and wisdoms have a role in shaping, you know, what we would now call formal legal policies. They were unstated laws. So the commons is actually an, a, a, is a very interesting, uh, how you interact with the commons, how you use the commons, how you manage it, how you govern it in traditional ways is also a very huge part of constitutionalism. So in that sense, the article 39 of the constitution speaks to that, that you know these are resources of the people, not of the state. So we must always contest the state when it monopolizes the commons. And the state is obviously, uh, today, uh, uh, you know, taken over by corporate and, uh, uh, you know, other interests and uh, that tension has to be worked out. That tension has to be addressed in a very intelligent way. So I would say, for instance, that I should have the right to ride a horse to my office, uh, considering the fact that that's probably more faster than uh, even, you know, uh, cycling, because <laughs> cycling, you need a road. Uh, uh, or maybe you know, I'll settle down to a bullock cart because it moves as fast as going in a car. Now, we grew up in a city where you could do that. We had tongas everywhere. We did not go by auto rickshaws. Now, can we not argue that a city can become uh, as deeply embedded in uh, the so-called carbon neutral city should have, uh, you know, horses and bullocks uh, feeding off the greenery of the city and then serving as, uh, you know, uh, methods of transport as well. So I'm just throwing in some ideas uh, and I would argue that to say that we don't have written policies would be a wrong notion. Uh, the law requires that the traditional policy, which is traditional knowledge and wisdom of governing commons needs to be embedded in urban planning. Thank you, Leo. I would also like to add uh, to what uh, you said and in the context of what Nita has asked there about uh, some of the sacred groves and the tabelas and the gautans uh, which are facing the backlash of all the financialization. Uh, again, you know, very close to Bangalore, there is this very beautiful uh, tamarind grove called the Nello Tamarind Grove, which was taken um, care by the local communities. Uh, who came there, grazed their uh, livestock, and they also uh, collected the tamarind once in a while and, uh, um, you know, made some little uh, money through which they put it back into the uh, protection of that tamarind grove. And the unique uh, feature of that tamarind grove is the tamarind grove has roots that emerge from the branches and it reroots itself just like the banyan. 
in such an amazing place once the biodiversity act came up a biodiversity management committee was set up funds did not flow and today that uh, nellore tamarind grove is in a very sad state and the only thing that has um, been put up there over the last uh, few years since the bmc was set up was they've changed the board of the tamarind grove beyond that there is a lot of garbage glass bottles the trees themselves are all falling falling apart um, unfortunately it has not caught the attention of any of the smart city programs or uh, the csr funds or no foundation or philanthropic organization too has come forward to protect that and it looks like if we don't do it now it it will be lost forever that unique uh, tamarind grove will be lost forever given that it is also very close to the international airport where real estate uh, is developing all over and uh, there is very little time for it to survive uh, anybody else would like to add? Purnendu, would you like to add? Yeah, yeah, yeah I would. Thank you. Taking, going on, uh, what Kirti and then Leo talked about, I have used, uh, I'd like to say that vocabulary is very important. You know, the point that uh, Leo was talking about communalization. You see, I've worked as a researcher in Northern and Western, in, Western India, mostly. And I know a little bit about the Deccan, but not too much. And that's about the commons. I feel that the commons as institution, as culture, as practice is relatively easily hijacked by revivalist vocabularies. And to that extent, one has to be very careful about how one is being understood. Uh, in Rajasthan in particular, and I know uh, my civil society here, like the back of my hand, having been part of it now for close to 40 years, uh, the entire vocabulary in which the commons are being talked about, I would say most of it is using uh, symbols which are predominantly upper caste in Hindu. Hmm? Uh, you rarely find an organization working with Dalits on the same platform as one that is talking about commons. And I think this is a major matter of concern because what we as people, as students of commons are trying to think through is not an agenda of revivalism. We do not want to create the institutions of caste which ensure that water is used sustainably by depriving or limiting certain groups access and enabling certain groups access. What we want to understand is that what are the principles of social organization in which we can use these resources in ways that are sustainable. And I feel that especially in today's times where uh, there is a plenty of uh, opportunities for taking a conversation in a different direction from the one in which it is intended is something to be careful about. I remember one meeting where a well-established uh, Dalit activist, uh, when I was talking about commons, uh, uh, referred to me as having as being an apologist for uh, uh, Hindu majoritarian agendas. So I do believe that uh, as you know, Leo pointed out, when you, when you live in a society where there are many groups, many communities and cultures, and I grew up in something like that, uh, you can see the diversity of ways in which different groups access commons, especially when referring to animals, you know, like uh, if you look at uh, who keeps poultry, who keeps chickens in Western Rajasthan, I can tell you the groups in the rural Rajasthan on my hands, only those groups will keep it. In urban areas, again, certain groups will be. So this is not something that is that can really be cleanly disembedded. We have to recognize that. So the idea, the necessity of the commons is important. And if it sometimes I veer in the direction of abstraction, it is because I think we need to develop a vocabulary which captures what we are trying to say, which expresses what we are trying to say, in a, in a way that is not uh, easily uh, taken in a direction which might not be what we intended. 
So that is uh, one observation that I thought I'd like to share. Thank you. Thank you, Purnendu. Pradeep, would you like to add to that? Um, just to bring to attention a, a remarkable little <clears throat> forest very close to Delhi called the Mangar Bunny, Bunny as in small buns, small forest, which uh, has actually been created by three villages um, populated by primarily by Gujars who are pastoralists uh, just across the border from Delhi into uh, Faridabad district in Haryana. And it's a remarkable forest because it's part of the Aravalis. It consists of almost pure forests of Anogaisis pendula, which is a, a habitat specialist tree that only grows on steep rocky slopes where water doesn't stay. And it also stands in complete uh, contrast to the surrounding places, which are owned and managed by the forest department, which are in shambles. And this, this, this particular forest, which is probably around 200, 250 acres, has been the scene over the last, uh, I'd say maybe 12 or 13 years of, it, it, it's, I, first, I first saw it in the year 2002 or 2003, I think, and, and first wrote about it as being one of the little jewels of an existing natural forest that has been protected by community action uh, close to Delhi, and that if we were unable to um, save this forest that had been, you know, so carefully sort of protected, and protected basically on a on a religious, um, I mean, on the grounds of superstition. Basically, what the what the people, what the Gujars said was that this forest was um, was it, it commemorated the memory of uh, Gudariya Das Baba, who was a saint who had uh, taken samadhi in the forest and that anybody who so much as um, harms uh, any anybody who so much as breaks a twig in the forest his home is going to burn or his mother in law is going to get after him some some terrible disaster would befall him and it worked like a charm because the the only people who are likely to have spoiled this forest would have been the pastoralists themselves so it was a case of the chor becoming the kotwal and it was very very effective and over the last 12 years or so, there's been a battle to try and save it as Gurgaon and other satellite sort of parts of the conurbation have grown closer and closer and closer until they're almost at the lip of this, this bowl forest uh, of Mangar Bani. And um, at the moment, it's, it's now sort of poised between either being completely engulfed by the conurbation uh, or perhaps, uh, I mean, the, its present legal status is that there's a 500 meter buffer zone around the forest that has very little legal protection, uh, but it's there. And we're actually watching with great interest as the, the, all the villages are now, so basically all this land in the forest used to be common land. It used to be village common land. Uh, and then by a series of, uh, judgments that took place uh, in the Punjab High Court from the 1980s onwards, all this common land became privatized and villagers started owning the land in the commons in the same way that you own a share. That is, this, that is to say, the land was not actually um, demarcated by meets and bounds, but you owned a share in the common land in proportion to the land that you actually owned in the agricultural zone. And we found that villagers were actually selling their shares uh, without any demarcation, sometimes two or three times over, as land sharks got more and more interested in this little bit of you know wonderful green forest there. So this is just an example of something that's happened very very close to Delhi, and I think we're very close to watching the end of this forest. I mean, it, I'd be surprised if Mangar Bunny survives another five or six years. Although there's been some remarkable work by some uh, lawyers and, and, and uh, activists to try and save this forest. But I just thought I'd mention this as a prime example of something very, very close to Delhi that we're watching uh, with great interest. Thank you.
thank you thank you so much uh, niti would you like to add some thoughts i know you've uh, typed in something but would you like to share uh, uh, i don't have anything to share i just have a question to uh, to, to pradeep uh, so are the gujars no longer involved the people who created the forest in mangarbani are they no longer involved do they don't have do they not have a relationship with that uh, land has it been you know what has happened to that i mean because that was the one that gave this land some life uh, so what has happened to the culture that depended that actually fostered this uh, forest so i think money turned their heads uh, nitya i think that clearly what happened was that as people got more and more interested in buying parcels of land uh, close to or inside mangarbani uh, they suddenly found that the kind of the value you know the, the the amount of money that was being offered was beyond their wildest dreams and uh, so the same people i mean the people the people who live in these three villages continue to be gujars but all of them have uh, in fact there was one tiny set of like three or four people who said look we must continue to protect this land and we mustn't do all this but they were completely outnumbered by the rest of the villagers so all the rest of the gujars basically joined the bandwagon of yeah. wanting to sell their shares and make as much money as they could thank you leo Leo, we are not able to hear you. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. So I'm. I'm just saying that I would like to read out what Niti wrote. He would. He should have read it, but I'll do it for him. I think the unsustainability and dangers of the city will become increasingly visible, as they are with COVID, urban flooding, water scarcity, each stress. we would need to plan for and seize the moments offered by nature exerting its agency to shift the narrative to deurbanize the alternative to urbanization of mega city should not be urbanization of peri urban or rural areas but something else the rural needs to be revisited as much as the urban the rural is by no means a utopia reimagining the rural and urban have to happen simultaneously with social justice intergenerational justice and interspecies justice as frameworks and human non human agents that speak for these constituencies as curators of the new imaginaries thank you thank you for reading that um kirti would you like to well i think uh, uh, is it is it over i think you know because of uh, this Uh, is there anyone else want to say something? Otherwise, I'll I just kind of. Uh, I don't uh, see any more questions, and I also saw that I thought I'll ask Amita to share her thoughts, but she's just left. So, should we close or? Uh, okay, okay. In that case, so no. I think we've been slightly better than last time because it's just a uh, fifteen minutes overrun. and i think you know we can we can take liberty to cover kind of another 15 minutes if there are any good questions or any good uh uh kind of responses to be to be uh, i think that looks uh, it looks pretty good so i uh, i'm saying that of course i think we could wind it up but if anyone has to say anything let's listen to them yeah uh, perhaps some closing thoughts from each of our uh, speakers purnendu I, not so much closing thoughts but one point that i felt was not covered in my view adequately in our discussion uh, is the problem of waste commons are now a dumping ground i think it's, all, it's well known i i don't need to uh, flag that point we deal, we do need to uh, discuss it either appropriated or used as dumping so any uh, discussion on commons in urban and peri urban spaces should take in this dimension also that's all thanks yeah uh, and definitely your point is very important in fact the last of the um, last week's webinar did deal with waste and governance where uh, we shared how the village grazing land here in um, bangalore 
in our village called Mahabalipura, how it was turned into a landfill and how uh, we had to take, uh, you know, go to the judiciary and uh, get the intervention from there to stop the landfill. You have but, discussed it. Okay. Yes. And even in fact, another point we missed sharing because there's so much uh, to discuss we missed was the Turali uh, area, the forest that we spoke about also had a landfill proposed and a waste processing facility proposed very close to it. And because it was uh, a, a lot of uh, local people protested, they stopped. But yes, waste is becoming a big issue and commons are um, spaces which are being targeted for uh, waste. Very uh, important point. I have just shared a link, uh, which actually is, uh, goes to the reports we have written two reports on how commons have become sites for dumping the city waste. Uh, for commons as lakes, commons as uh, streets, commons as forests, and commons as grazing pastures are all targets. And uh, the Bangalore is the first city which actually, uh, as a response to a PIL we filed 10 years ago this year, uh, the court ruled that landfilling must end. Landfilling is not a solution. And that in turn, uh, compelled the Union Ministry of Environment to reformulate its proposal to, you know, the 2016 solid waste management rules actually address that concern that you cannot take commons and turn them into, uh, you know, landfills and dumping grounds. Though it is happening, it's not to say that it is not happening, but the rule is against it. The law, the or the judicial mind is against it. Thank you. Uh, I just have a, you know, a small twist to that. I think that, you know, dumping of waste is one thing, dumping of value, because what this society perceives as value is also being dumped on the commons. And that I think is a far more dangerous thing. That is the process of growth. That is the process of urbanization. That is the process of development where the state dumps or you know encroaches on commons in order to develop roads or develop uh, ports and develop uh, airports and develop all the other infrastructure that define what a world class city is so i think that uh, there is you know if if we look at the state I, and i look at the state as an agent of private business i don't see it as a representative of myself or of people um, in the country but it is an, it is a representative of an agent of private business, then urbanization is a response and outcome of this relationship between the state and private business. And so we also need to be able to reimagine state. I do not think that uh, a way out of this uh, dilemma is possible within the current definition of the state, the economy, etc. Yeah, yeah. Be very powerful um, thoughts. Very true. Um, Pradeep, some closing comments from. I, I'm I'm just curious, uh, Leo, to know whether and to what extent you might have had any success in um, interceding in the whole planning in the master planning process because that's what creates. That's what creates land use zoning. That's what actually then allows courts to take decisions about major facts about cities. And I'm not an urban planner and I know very little about it, but I do get the impression that all our urban planning in India is still hanging on to the coattails of a town and country planning methodology and a way of thinking that we inherited from the British in the 1950s, which was basically trend based. You looked at trends over the last 20 years, whether it was consumption of electricity, whether it was roads, whether it was dwelling units, and you extended that into the future. And you said, well, the job of the planner is to make sure that we have enough drinking water and enough roads and enough all of that. And that seems to be a, a completely outmoded way of thinking and doing things. The West abandoned this in the early 1970s. And I think, I think if one was to try and identify the, the ideal objectives of planning, it would be to, you know, uh, I would say to 
to, identif to, to identify desirable outcomes from the point of view of somebody living in a city, you know? And that's not what tends to happen. I mean, I've, I've seen this dismal new master plan for Delhi, which came out last year, you know? And it, it just seems to exemplify all the shortcomings and faults of this old system of planning. So my question to you is, to what extent do you see inter intervening and being able to influence the, the nature of master plans as being crucial to being able to affect the kind of changes that you want? It's a big question, but I'll try to be brief because you're pushing a lack of time. Uh, yesterday and day before, there were protests against the peripheral ring road around Bangalore. The farmers who mobilized uh, against that, as well as uh, you know, predominantly also Dalit organizations, their argument was that, you know, it's, it's an argument we have heard before, whose road is it anyway, right? That was one leg. The other leg is who decided that it has to come into our farms? And the third leg is if it has to come into our farms, what is the due process by which you came here? And they're not talking about law. They're talking about the type of conversation that they say, we should feel like this is a win-win for us. If it is a loss for us and win for us, this is colonization, you know, uh, in the 21st century of our land. So they are not free uh, in the free India that we speak of. So that's the kind of uh, protests. And the farmers were arrested by the police and kept out of uh, so-called environmental public hearing. Uh, and this has become epidemic across cities that you use planning processes to attack fundamental rights. You manipulate planning process and look at what the Ministry of Environment has done with the so-called environment impact assessment notificate. It has comprehensively diluted it by incrementally amending it and not even through proper amendments, but all sorts of tricks that they play, the bureaucrats play. So I think we are in a very dangerous position because at least if the Town and Country Planning Act were implemented, it has at least a framework which you can relate with. But there are no frameworks today. The entire planning process, like in Delhi, you said, is horrendous. Of Bangalore is also equally, if not as big, uh, as much as of the scale that you frighteningly mentioned, 53 million people, come on, uh, are we out of our minds? Uh, Bangalore has a plan to accommodate 23 million people. So how are we going to sort of, you know, what kind of politics will we have? We have seen that this kind of large metropolitization actually creates a gatedness, it creates exclusion. It, uh, it, it dogmatizes conversation. It uh, makes us intolerant. It, uh, you know, all sorts of negative emotions of the human mind, the human being uh, become more prevalent. And so I think these are the dimensions we also need to worry about. And, you know, if you look at uh, uh, the mental health crisis in the country, it's humongous. And we don't even think about it. Uh, in the ways we need to think about. You know, it's such a serious problem. Uh, so just like we don't talk about diabetes, which is bad food everywhere, right? And the cities are the, the places where you get the most, the worst food you can ever imagine. The kind of cooking oils that are being, 60% of the cooking oil is not oil, it's paraffin oil that is being sold as oil, cooking oil. So these are the kind of questions that, I mean, you really need to make this common conversations, not conversations amongst a few of us and that we are not able to transcend. So it's not just the fact that the laws that are stuck, but it's also that our conversations are stuck in time. Our conversations need to be more commonplace in terms of the type of reforms that are required. And I completely agree with what uh, uh, all of you said and especially Niti that, you know, if we cannot make cities inclusive in the sense that this article 39 of the constitution says, that the purpose of any production of value out of the material resource of the country has to serve the common good. Otherwise, it's antithetical to the idea of this nation. Then you read it with Article 243 ZD and ZE, uh, where it says that it has to be that that production of value has to be ground up, not top down. And look at everything that is being done now. It is top down. It is almost like you know we are. Switching back 5,000 years ago to the time of pharaohs. So that's the kind of, uh, I mean, we need to resist it. it resistance has now become a, uh, an obligation. It's a fundamental duty, resistance to this type of uh, developmentalism and majoritarian developmentalism and also communalizing it. And then financializing it and 
making disasters normative yeah i think uh, to add to that also the fact that we've set up so many parastatals in every city while um, bda makes the master plan for bangalore we have bescom digging up bwssb digging up bmrda planning something else in a peripheral area of bangalore and the last decade or so we've had new parastatals the like the bayapa uh, which is developing the area around the airport it while the airport was um, formed in bangalore the new international airport it literally the run one of the runways literally sits on one side of a lake called the betakote lake and the lake was destroyed and now they ran out of water so they recreated a lake in front of the bangalore airport those of you who visited bangalore would have seen it and that has definitely uh, disturbed the drainage pattern of uh, you know that landscape but nobody ever questions nobody to ask anybody nobody to hold anyone accountable because each parastatal is doing things that it thinks is right so the master plan remains a document where you know everybody in the city gets to see it once if you go to a center of the city where it is exhibited and there is some noise about it but the master plan is not a document that is set in stone and planned accordingly in coordination with all the organizations so these are some very new problems and now the smart city company is an entity by itself again not accountable to anybody and one of the smart city uh, programs in um, Tumkur, the neighboring district of Bangalore, has developed a lake in the most bizarre way, which is completely against what the provisions of uh, the NK Patil committee report gave or what the final court order gave, which is applicable to all the uh, lakes in Karnataka. So I think parastatals are a problem and we need to uh, have more conversations on whether more parastatals should be set up or should be closed the parastatals or uh, you know those kind of questions also need to be asked yeah thank you uh, we have a request uh, if ankisha or anirudh can uh, give access to niti he would like to play a song yeah so uh, for a change the song is not in tamil it's uh... It's a song without lyrics. It's an instrumental that plays on the different rhythms. There's the rhythm of the Porambok, and then there's the rhythm of the uh, industrialized uh, uh, world. So uh, we're just kind of playing on that. And I just wanted to share that with you. Can you share the link so it can be played by one of us? It's not been released yet. So you guys are having a preview. OK. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Sorry, there's no. Is there sound? No, sir. Actually, we have to share with. No. Niti, uh, there's no sound. Sorry, there's no sound, but I think there is no sound. But please, please go through. I think visuals will be good. Yeah, yeah. There is no sound. Is it? No, you have to share oh. with audio. Yeah, yeah. Share with audio. Oh, what more? One more. One moment. Yeah, yeah. Share with audio. One moment. Damn, how do I do that now? So while you, uh, well, there is a uh, uh, screen sharing uh, screen. There is a uh, share sound button at the left and bottom of that window. Ah, yes. Got it. Many clicks to this, okay. No? No, sir. No, sir. 
Niti, just go through the video again. It doesn't matter. Oh, okay. You got it. Oh, the visuals were so powerful. We could imagine what the audio would be like. Thank you so much for sharing that. We look forward to its release so that we can all see it again. So thank you so much, uh, everybody. I know some of our speakers had to leave uh, because it, we really went beyond the time and they had other commitments, uh, but a sincere, and a very big thanks to everybody from ESG. I would like to thank Ankisha, Kea, Janani, Shruti, uh, Anirudh, uh, and also Kripa, who's been uh, helping us um, behind the scene here. They've been tweeting and uh, they've uh, released a bunch of very interesting tweets. Uh, kindly stay tuned for a detailed report as well. Thank you and look forward to seeing all of you next week. Uh, if uh, Kirti or Leo would like to say yeah. something. Yeah, I think, I, I think, can I come in? I think, you know, I have to do my traditional thank you. Uh, but before I do that, essentially want to do very quickly three things. Uh, I know the, the, the presence is thinning very fast. But still, I think, you know, uh, I, I really have some duties to perform. Number one is this, that I just wanted to know people here, and Leo and Bhagwiji, you personally, especially, that we are 
launching a competition most probably next month is called retrieving public open spaces without hurting the informal enterprises and informal settlements. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, idea is to, and this is not only meant for planners and architects, this is for common citizens. Idea is to really let people go because they see, uh, uh, idea is to say no to eviction. Idea is to tell people that if you believe in inclusive cities, We've got to respect and understand the needs of the informal sector, and we've got to find ways to integrate them. And, uh, and I would, Leo and Bhagwiji, very much your partnership, if you agree, uh, we, we should do this together because you know, then it will have a greater impact. You know, I will share with you a note we have done recently. And uh, it's, it's a small part, it's a microcosm of all, all that you're saying but it's something which touches the heart of the city, especially in the context of the poor and in the context of retrieving public spaces that we need. So that's one. Second thing is this, that, uh, and I, I just, I just kind of skipped saying this, you know, 20 odd years ago, Leo, I was part of a, a civil society consultants consultation in, uh, in, 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 in Malaysia, uh, in a place called Kanton. And about 30 of us produced a very interesting, what we call at that time, Panchashila. We were talking about the image of Asian city. And we came up with these five words, and I want to say them, and then add something to it. We said, we're looking for politically participatory, culturally vibrant, economically productive, economic, uh, socially just and environmentally sustainable cities. That was something that we put, and I'm very proud and I time and again quote it because it came from civil society and it came from civil society of Asia. I continue adding to this. And as a matter of fact, today's meeting added, brought in a few more that one would like to add, which of course is there is the, we're talking about livable cities. We're talking about people caring cities. We are talking about culturally responsive cities. We're talking about nature friendly cities. We are talking about cities in harmony with tradition and, 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 and people and culture. So, uh, uh, and, 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 and I think, and, and then of course, uh, I'm deliberately not using the word smart cities. And of course, I'm not talking about cities governed and created by real estate and real estate things. So this is a second thing that I thought I'll mention to you. And third thing is this, that I must thank this remarkable group today. Thank you, uh, Leo, and thank you, uh, Bhargaviji, for a very, very thought-provoking, uh, beautifully presented, and uh, rich in every respect, uh, the whole, whole presentation. Even though it's two and a half hours, uh, it, it, uh, I, th I think it was, it, was, it was very, very rich. So thank you very much. Uh, your first was on West uh, and governance. This one is on... Uh, challenges of securing urban commons. Uh, I don't remember now which the third one is, but I think you know, it should be and mobility and infrastructure. And transport. So we look forward. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Next and then, uh, let me let me thank the panelists here, but Pradeep Krishanji, I'm very sad that you know, Sushma Ayangar couldn't kind of stay and had to pull out because of technical glitches. Uh, uh, she would have added a, a huge dimension because they have been doing some remarkable work. Uh, Purnendu Kavuri ji, Nityaran Jairam ji, and of course, uh, uh, my colleagues, Ankisha. And of course, now we have one more. Uh, uh, which is uh, uh, Abhijit Joshi, who is helping 
I was told that, you know, even though our numbers have not grown out, I was told that we reached out to 40,000 people in the last three days talking about this. So even they have not come, I'm sure they are somewhere and they will find a way to listen to this wonderful dialogue. I also must thank Anurudh Manan and many others who are part of this. So thank you very much. Look forward to one more uh, webinar, more deeply researched and strongly felt uh, uh, subject. And uh, uh, it's, it's such, a, such a wonderful associating with you. Before you go, once again, my request, if you want, we'll mold it slightly, but let's do that together because uh, uh, we could then, I think, look at uh, public open spaces in terms of how do people want to retrieve them? What are their solutions? And, uh, and, and, and I personally feel very interesting. So thank you very much again.